This is the Marley call on Monday, May 15th, 2023. And we have a treat this morning because last week Stuart mentioned a piece out of a book that he wrote. Uh, and he would like to explain that to us because we were busy talking about agreements and trying to figure out what goes where. And this is a nice foundation for that. So um, I think with no further ado, because I think you only have a half hour uh, with us. If, we... if we could wait for a minute, maybe. Um, I think Joanne's going to join us. Oh, cool. Just going to ask you that. I just texted her. <laughs> okay, good. And Jesse Up just joined. Um, and we may have another couple people. Uh, would anybody like to sing a tune or tell a joke in the meantime? <laughs> I had a song, oh yeah, I had a song that came to mind that has to do with the kind of agreements. And it was uh, it was Billy Joel's, it was um, Band of Brothers, I guess. And we would all go down together. That's sort of like the feel for any agreement I want to be a part of. Cool. Okay. Joanne. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Mm -hmm. Band of Brothers, Billy Joel. Hmm. I think that's what the song is called. I don't know. I just heard that song in my sounds, mind. Sounds like a Billy Joel song. Um, if, yeah. It's funny. I, I was listening to him someplace recently, and um, it's pretty amazing that he hasn't recorded any new music, I think, since somewhere in the 1980s. And uh, his music is still very poignant. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably just want to like rewrite it, like instead of just brothers, like maybe shift it, brothers and sisters, I don't know, just <laughs> tweak these little things. I'm not finding a, a song called Band of Brothers by Billy Joel, but I mean, no. I'll, like, mm -hmm. Peter, I'll find the chorus that. later. It, it was just the, the sentiment of the chorus. Yeah. Of we would all go down, to, not that we're going to go down together, but... <laughs> Sweet. We'd be yeah. together. Okay. Yeah, I remember that lyric. Maybe it's just not named Band of Brothers, the song that it came from. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's named Goodbye Saigon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just maybe. Just maybe. Just maybe. <laughs> well, I asked ChatGPT, and I didn't fact check it by the time I said that. So <laughs> that was the next thing I was going to do. So, so there's uh, probably a hallucinated song. <laughs> um, the GPT says it's part of uh, 1982, uh, the Nylon Curtain album. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We probably should let Stuart start. Cool. <laughs> because we could go on this way for a long time. And now we've got the quorum. Yeah. And what was the name of the song again? Uh, Good night, Saigon. Thanks. Okay. So um, I don't know if anybody saw it, but in the in the feed this morning, I just decided to and, and respond to Jerry's announcement of this meeting. And I sent out a file um, with the elements of the agreement. They're also posted in chat, okay? And that's what I'll talk to, so you have it. By way of by way of context, and this is a this is a really interesting um, piece of background. Um, in the late 1980s, I was working with a consultant trying to come up with an innovation for the legal profession. And, um, you know, it was, it was in the, um, in the years where um, me mediation, also known as alternative, uh, district, uh, alternative dispute resolution was kind of filtering up and, and people were um, talking about it and engaged. Um, but where, where my consultant, thinking partner took me was, well, maybe there's a greater innovation than, you know, resolving conflict in a mediated fashion. Maybe we can prevent a lot of conflict um, if we have what we'll call agreements for results as opposed to agreements for protection, i.e. if you look at legal agreements, they're all about protection. What if this goes wrong and what if that goes wrong? And as lawyers tend to get older, their agreements tend to get thicker because they've seen more crap happen and they try to prevent it. Having said that, the agreements that are prepared only get pulled out in a traditional sense when relationships break down, right? 
And that's when everybody starts looking at the specific language and the verbiage and blah, 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 blah. And that's what all the legal battles and litigation are about. All right. That being said, um, when I wrote my first book, Getting to Resolution, Turning Conflict into Collaboration, I really wanted to write the book of agreement because that was the innovation. But even my publisher, as brilliant as he was, an editor, didn't get it. He just he just didn't get it and ended up, you know, pushing me towards writing this book about the whole process of resolving conflict. So I had to write a second book called The Book of Agreement, in which I um, articulated what I'm about to share with you. All right. So um, by way of process, all right. Um, and I've done this many, many times in many, many different contexts. The real um, essence of what we're trying to do is make explicit what's implicit so that everybody is really on the same page and we dot all the I's and cross all the T's in terms of what it is we're doing together. Um, in the world today, most people operate from a ready, fire, aim mode as opposed to ready, aim, fire. And what I want to do is drop in the aim and, and create clarity on this project, um, what it is we're doing and how it is that we're gonna get there. So um, what I would offer to do is facilitate um, an agreement and my deliverable would actually be a written agreement. And I would kind of scribe as people are talking as we go through this process. Um, And so, you know, the, the elements of what we would talk about, and we're not going to wordsmith this, um, but what we're going to do is, is see what the shared vision is. You know, the first element, number one, is what's our intent and vision? Um, what is it that we're trying to create? And, and if we were real successful at it, you know, we could look at it six months out, a year out. Um, what's a vision of success look like? Number two, what roles? What roles are necessary? And who's going to um, take responsibility for picking up that particular role? What are they, they responsible for? So like we've already, we've already talked about, you know, an, a, uh, an editorial board, um, things of that nature, and other things that we think are critical in order to um, reach the vision. Number three is promises. Um, and that has two components. What is each one of us going to do to bring this vision into reality? Um, you know, everything, everything in the world starts with a thought, an idea, and then you try to manifest it uh, in reality. So what do we need to do? What action do we need to take? Uh, what promises do we need to make? And the other, the other piece of the, um, um, the promises is how are we going to be with each other in this process? You know, how are we going to be with each other? What's the little culture we want to create for this project? Um, number four, time and value. Um, how long are we in this for? But the more important one is value. What value does each person perceive that they're taking out uh, of the project? Because we all know that if someone perceives they're not getting something out, often performance stops. You know, and when I say value, it's not necessarily uh, any kind of uh, monetary value, but what's what's the value? I mean, for me, working on this project, it's pure psychic value in terms of contribution to something that is a contribution. Um, number five, metrics. Uh, one of the reasons projects often fail is people have disagreements about whether or not they actually succeeded because they hadn't. Uh, articulated clear metrics. So what are the, some of the metrics that we're going to use to measure our own success? Um, concerns and fears. Um, as we begin, um, what are our concerns and fears? There's a very classic business story, business parable called the Abilene Paradox, um, wherein people make a, a, a nasty a uh, trip um, to Abilene, Texas, and only to find out that nobody really wanted to go, but everybody was afraid to 
point out the concerns <laughs> before they tick off. So it's an important element of articulating a good agreement. Renegotiation, you know, we know what we know. We don't know what we don't know. Um, and so as we move forward, you know, we have to be open to the whole notion of, you know, ongoing renegotiation. Um, consequences slash at stakeness. Um, so what's at stake here? What's at stake for um, us in this project? What's at stake for the um, people we want to serve? What, what really is um, um, at the core of what it is we're doing? What's, what's at stake? Um, conflict resolution, how are we going to resolve inevitable uh, differences or conflict that comes up? Um, and I see conflict on a great continuum. Uh, differences only turn into conflict. Differences are a good thing. Differences only turn into conflict when people become ego identified with their own particular positions. And, and the last element, after all of those things that we just talked about, each of the elements, um, agreement and trust, um, are we on the same page? Do we trust each other going forward? Do we want to say yes um, in moving forward? So that's the, um, that's the essence and, and really the simplicity um, of this process. You know, the challenge, the biggest, cha the biggest challenge is that most people don't stop and articulate this before they begin a project. And, you know, as you've, as you've seen a little bit of my own frustration over the past weeks, whenever I show up for a meeting, I keep kind of pounding on this fact of what are we doing here? <laughs> what are we doing here? As we kind of get into the weeds before we we painted kind of, you know, a big picture and created a little bit of a container to hold what it is that we're doing. So it's a little bit of a, uh, <laughs> yes, in the book of agreement, there is actually a, an agreement about a really good marriage agreement. <laughs> the book of agreement explains the theory and then it has about 35 examples of agreements that I've I, I created over time. Um, and, you know, since I wrote the book, there are hundreds more that I've done. So that's 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 the essence of what I would propose to do. Thoughts, questions, comments. Um, and then, oh, yeah, one more one more piece. Then we have a written document, you know, maybe it's three pages long or something like that that and then you have something to look at as a charter and you know every quarter or, or few months you take a peek at it and how are we doing um are we still aligned here you know what do we need to what do we need to tweak etc so that's my that's my offer mm -hmm. have you ever considered or posted this as a template so that people could just pull one down and start filling it out sort of thing uh many times but not in the past few years. I thought it would make a great app, um, you know, for people to actually use this as at the beginning of a at the beginning of a project. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That'd be really interesting, especially with a little bit of extra coaching for the different stages and so forth. It would make a nice a nice app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments, thoughts, anybody. Looks really good, Stuart. Thanks. To me, it's like a little no-brainer. When I teach, when I talk about this stuff and teach about this stuff, there used to be a um, many years ago a commercial for Fram oil filters, and the tagline was "Pay me now or pay me later," and and then translates to you know do a little work up front or you're going to get into some conflict later on because you haven't created clarity about what it is that you're doing together. Mm -hmm. Other questions or thoughts? I found the Fam Oil Filter commercial. <laughs> <laughs> it is, of course, on on YouTube, the nexus of all knowledge and wisdom, <laughs> all of humanity. Mm -hmm. Chilling. And yeah, mm -hmm. we just posted it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I'm 
I'm kind of interested in, Pete, how you were unpacking this uh, in your mind and contrasting this or overlaying it with uh, both everything is a project and your uh, sun, moon, stars uh, idea. So, um, be, 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 yeah, before Pete says anything, yeah. just let me interject that um, um, everything is a project. Yes, for a while I was on the PMI circuit um, teaching this stuff um, in all of the um, local PMI chapters and some of the some of the some of the regional chapters. Mm -hmm. Cool. And Jesse has her hand up, so I, I don't know if Pete you want to go or if Jesse should go. Um, I, I I think Jesse should go. Jesse, jump in, please. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, I'm just always inspired by these kinds of frameworks. So thank you for putting it together and sharing. Um, yeah, I'm, I was just, as you were talking, I was curious to what, what you're most passionate about, what, what revs you up the most when you're talking about this as an outcome, what is your manifesto, your vision having on the other side, having shared this, um, that's what I, I really wanted context for this conversation. So great. So um, in 10 years of law practice, many years ago, um, I saw a lot of crap. <laughs> and given who I was, you know, um, my my essence is to see systems and try to create things that work for people. I mean that's essentially where where I live, and this is one of the um, pieces I came up with as a as an innovation. Um, so, just sharing this and having people see the value and benefit um, kind of is exciting for me. It's it, it's actually uh, what what I think and hope and will will go down as a, a piece of legacy. It's actually at the at the core of the essence. There's a there's a um, there's a bit of a movement in the legal profession called conscious contracting. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard that. And and this this body of work is at the core of that. In other words, the people who have moved conscious contracting along um, acknowledge that this is the this is the core of it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like you're setting up people for success and looking around corners before things happen and conscious decision making at its core. And I, I'm just curious, like, what are those signals that you're going, uh huh, this is working. Yep, this is working. Like in the beginning, everyone's happy and saying yes and nodding their heads. And then something happens and they get through it. Is that a signal that this is working? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what it what it does also is as you as you engage in in um in this process, essentially you create relationship. Mm. Okay, at a at a at a more um in, at, a, at a more explicit level, and when we have relationship in a project at a more explicit level, um, we tend to to work together well. We tend to move through stuff. We tend to have already articulated how we're going to resolve differences and 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 conflict. I love it. Sounds like a journey instead of the destination. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. But briefly, also just uh, flip something in before Pete. Uh, it seems like once you have a, a experience with other with other parties in using these agreement forms, then several of these things just become default settings. And you don't you don't have to sort of talk through all the different parts, but hey, here's how we do conflict resolution. Okay, good. We we figured that out like five years ago, and we're just going to keep doing that until one of us decides there's a better way to do that, and then we'll swap in a new module, kind of. But but you know, experience would be helpful here because it really would reduce the time needed to to start any, to spin anything, anything up. Yeah, there's a few of the a few of these elements, Jerry, are um, are boilerplate. Okay. Um... So yeah, everything is not necessarily uh, um, fresh. The, the other thing I want to say is that um, there's not a huge amount of negotiation or wordsmithing. Um, in other words, it's a it's a shared vision. 
Um, it's cumulative. Um, so it's not either what Jerry thinks or what Pete thinks, but it's what they both think. Pete, over to you in the booth. Um, cool. I, I, I think I don't want to say too much. I so Jerry and I and and OGM have. Um, I've been coaching OGM uh, with with a framework I call Everything as a Project uh, for a couple of years. Um, so I put links in the chat. Um, the Earth Moon Star Space uh, framework. Um, is, is also relevant. So thanks, Jerry, for asking about them. The um, uh, uh, Stuart's framework is a lot more, um, I, I leave a lot of this stuff out as, um, uh, as defaults, kind of the, the way you said it, Jerry. Um, uh, so, um, uh, Stuart's done a really good job of explaining things and being clear about, uh, so uh, metrics is something that uh, I, I guess I kind of hit maybe in everything as a project on EMSS. Concerns and fears, I don't, um, but I think those are really good. Um, uh, renegotiation, I don't include those. Uh, it's really good. The, there's the, the, there's a, a bit of a difference. Um, uh, everything is a project, and then EMSS is kind of everything as an organization. Um, uh, it adds a little bit more framework kind of for the administration of the agreements. Um, so that's kind of the difference. Um, and then I, I want to flag uh, something uh, which I've been working on for a year or two, which is... Um, uh, autonomy. Um, so one of the, um, one of the, I, and I'm not saying this is something that Stuart would lead us into, but one of the things that can happen uh, with a, a well fleshed out agreement like this is you can, in, in the past, it's typical to set up an agreement and then everyone subscribes to this agreement. Yes, I agree to all of this thing. And um, uh, a, a failure mode that can happen is you get people who sign up to an agreement, but they actually don't agree with the whole agreement. So um, I've been working on decentralized, uh, autonomous individuals, organizations, and then decentralization of the coordination, the agreement part. and the one of the keys is to make sure that everyone everyone agrees with everything that they're agreeing they, they say they're agreeing to if somebody says um you know we we agree to value um uh, uh number four um stuart's got time slash value you know here's here's how i have here's how we've agreed to um value my contribution or value your contribution. Um, if somebody doesn't agree with that the way that is, but they say, yeah, sure, whatever, because they want to get done with the agreement, then you've got this little um, uh, whole, whole weakness in the, the overall structure. Um, so that's something to kind of watch for, I, I think. Um, it's, it's really easy for a group of people to go, why don't we all just sign this agreement? Because it seems reasonable. <laughs> Um, and that's the, the typical way, in a, especially in a corporation, you know, you're agreeing. So an employee is agreeing with management, you know, here, employee, you agree with all this, right? And the employee looks around and it's like, okay, well, I guess everybody else is signing it. I think there's a lot of BS in here, but I guess I've got to sign it too. People will sign up for things that they don't necessarily agree with. So I'm, I, I'm because I've been working on decentralized uh, autonomous organizations for a couple of years, I get really sensitive to making sure that we're not doing that in, in situations like this. So um, I know Stacy wants to say something, but just a few thoughts while uh, what Pete shared is, is, is fresh in my mind. Um, so in terms of, you know, administration stuff, um, under roles and under promises, 
that's where that kind of stuff would come out. Um, I appreciate your concern in terms of people just kind of going along, but part of that, part of this, and I'm really glad that we've got a smaller group here. Part of it depends upon the integrity of every individual who's participating, feeling, all right, let's, let's, you know, this is not about, you know, going along to get along. This is about creating a shared vision for something that we think is important that we can manifest as a, as a, as a bit of a, a gift to the world. Um, and I think that that's important that people stay in integrity around that. Because one of my premises, after you've talked about one through nine, you don't say yes to number 10, that there's an agreement and trust until really the I's are dotted and the cross and the T's are crossed and you're ready to, you know, you're ready to jump in and you feel that there's a, a great level of kind of uh, alignment. And, and the optionality of aspects of an agreement is a variable to play with in designing these sorts of systems. But the more optional these things are, the more everyone is unlikely to be sure about what each person's stance is on the full agreement. And insistence on signing off on a full agreement forces the issue of negotiating and agreeing to the different parts of it so that you have one standing thing. And, and I know that you could have a, a, a web page that says, for Pete, for me, for Stacy, here's the pieces of it. Here's how we here's how we're agreeing to work together, um, and that could work well. So I, I don't know what that balance is, but but the the process of having an agreement, but then trying to make sure that everybody understands it does reduce doubt. Yeah. yeah. So um, so as a practical matter, here's what it would look like in terms of um, time. Um, I think we could do this in one one session, um, one 90 minute session. We should be able to kind of um, knock this off, assuming I can I, I can type fast enough and you guys talk slow enough. <laughs> well, we, we also can collaboratively edit a document and we have a live transcript running, which we can copy paste from pretty quickly. So that will help as well. There, there you go. And so after you know one of these meetings, we have an agreement that we can look at, and then we can do a little bit of, um, you know, wordsmithing slash tweaking, um, and off we go. Um, Pete, if we went through that in a session, how much of everything is an organization would this cover? Is it like fifty percent ish? Uh, it it depends. You could cover you know 10 or 20 percent or you could cover 100 percent depends you know depends okay I, it would be nice it would be I, i'm interested in doing that and then crafting it so that it covers more not less of what you're looking to do with us as well pete yeah anyone else oh, Stacey. Mention, yeah i just want and this may have to do with the difference of what is an organization but i wanted to point to oh, now the chat just changed um Pete had put in that he had put in Stewart's text into the hack MD subject to Stewart's approval. And for me, that's an example of something that would hold things up. Whereas if the organization already had an agreement as to whether or not that could have been put into a hack MD. So I think there are certain things that we don't even think of of things that belong to an agreement. So I would have actually stopped and I would like to ask Stuart about that and have that conversation because what Stuart may say to that question may be different to what Klaus may say to that question. And I want to know what each of the people within the organization have to say about that because that's how we really learn. Even within an organization, there's different groups and teams. So what's the question, Stacey? Um, it, maybe I, I'll I'll try it. Um, Thank you, <laughs> uh, Stuart. Uh, some of us had trouble uh, reading the word doc. Um, okay. And I know this organization is HackMD literate, more or less. Um, so what I did is I took all the text from the word doc, pasted it on a HackMD, and then in the in the chat I said, you know, I've I've done this subject to Stuart's approval. 
Um, and we may just delete the whole thing um, by the end of the meeting. So Stacy, the reason I said it that way is because I actually, I, I bent well, I, the rules a little bit um, I because, you know, Stuart's a published author. I understand you know, that. Gave us, I'm using it as an example. I, I understand yeah. what you, it says isn't about you. I'm using that as an example. Yeah. Of, yeah, it's, so, I understand so the why only, you did what you did. What I'm saying is, There will be different OGM members that because they are yeah. published authors are going to feel a certain way, or because they hope to be published authors are going to feel a certain way. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But those are things that people usually don't verbalize. And to Stuart's point, when Stuart, you were saying how conflicts, how they start as differences, but they don't have to be disagreements. Another reason is because sometimes they just get avoided. And so, um, you know me, I'm about bringing it up to the surface so that we don't avoid things. Yeah. So my 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 quick response to the to the to the background question that Pete raised is, um, even though I'm a lawyer, even though I'm a published author, my my view of intellectual property is a Native American review <laughs> view. Okay. Um, it's kind of like. It's even beyond commons. It's it's please use it. Okay. Please use it. Use it. Use it. Use it. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't know that about you. And one of the reasons I asked you if you had put these templates out earlier was exactly the same impulse, which is I really try to publish everything as openly as I possibly can for reuse. And then as we were, got a little deeper into the call, I was in my mind, I was like, oh man, could we create a very, very simple <laughs> portable web app? that absolutely amplified this and points right back to you and what you've done, but that is contagious everywhere. And that, that says, hey, people, here's here's a way to go do this. And here's a very simple process that'll step you through it with some with some hints and tips, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I was kind of excited about that already. Love it. Great. Beautiful. I got to go to another, another uh, meeting, but... Um... Just let me know. I'm here. Yeah, thank, thank you, Stuart. That was all. That was perfect. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Since we're contemplating, since since we're working in a, in a, in publishing, I guess. Um, it it would so the the question I didn't get to ask Stuart real quick is uh so is that um. So you all probably know Creative Commons. You know, hey Stuart. Are you thinking CC BY or CC zero or whatever? So those are shorthands for legal frameworks that that other people have developed. Um, unfortunately, most of our world, our civilized world, doesn't run on Native American uh, uh, beliefs if, about if the commons. So you actually do need to put a legal stamp on it, and the legal stamp, the you know the framework, the CC framework is. Somebody spent a lot of, someone's spent many, 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 you know, thousands of hours setting it up so that we could say, is that CC by, is it CC by NC, is it CC zero, whatever, you know. Um, so we have those frameworks and I would suggest that we use them. We don't have to, but um, uh, it's going to hurt if we don't sooner or later. Other uh, thoughts, questions? Uh, any, uh, go ahead, Pete. Did you want to clarify something or have I, you know, I, so, uh, so just on that, on the HackMD, um, I put, I did something that Stuart didn't really ask for, but it's a nice thing. Um, I, I said this was by Stuart Livy, and this is not, um, not in his original text. It, you know, makes sense. So I was super tempted to put CC by here or some CC by NC or something, but, um, but we should ask him about that. Um, the other one I really love is Copy Heart. Some of you have heard me talk about Copy Heart. So yeah. Copy Heart is very similar to what Stuart said. Do you, uh, do you do we have implicit um, permission from Stuart to post this to the OGM wiki? And if not, would you like to ping him and say this is what it would look like and this is where it would go? Because I, I would think it would be a great start for some of what we're talking about. Um, I, I think we should... I well, I, I, we have implicit permit. Yeah, he said, "Do what you want." Yeah. 
Um, so if, if you will simply just write it out that way, I think that'll solve our problem for where it is. And then we can share that back into the Marley channel and, and know that we've got it and move and, and move on. And is anybody else interested in, uh, this is a side dish. This is not a really, well, gosh, this is sort of a Marley thing and I'm happy to explain why it is. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this, not just being a template that people could sort of pull down and start answering questions in, but rather something that, that sort of steps people through. And when Stuart said this could be an app, um, the app world in some cases is moving away from apps, as far as I can tell, toward simply mobile uh, web, mobile web uh, app like things where you just bring the thing up on your phone, but it's, it's not a separate app you have to download, but it runs really elegantly on a phone. Uh, as well as on a on a browser, and I can I can envision that this could be a really fun, simple, short uh, thing that would be very useful to people. Anybody, raise your hand if this is puzzling, in, intriguing to you. It's it's Please. intriguing, and it doesn't sound simple or easy. Okay. Well, I mean, I was, go ahead. Sorry. So the the content of this is easy to read, and it's well well put together and stuff like that um the the process of you know drafting an agreement Stuart was offering help as an expert right he's he and he could take us through this in 90 minutes i think if you give people this text or an app that that wizarded them through this text that that's missing the magic of what Stuart, you know Stuart or some other experienced facilitator would be doing so I can imagine an app that does the skilled facilitation that that Stuart would do not as well, probably because it wouldn't be a human, but but it's not that that part isn't simple or easy. Agreed. Go ahead, Stacey. When I was watching your wheels turn while he was talking, because I was right there with you and I was thinking about the Marley project and I was just wondering because there were parts to his text that I would want to pull out like I was thinking when Pete mentioned like DAOs, for me, OGM and the different people and the different working groups, I envision them as, as like different DAOs, like different groups of people kind of work under these unspoken rules when they work together. At least that's what I find with people that I work with. It's kind of different sets of rules. And um, I thought that that would, like what we were trying to do with the sample book, like I always thought the idea of the sample book is to show how we could pull pieces out and use them in different places. So I, I was, yeah, so I thought we were, again, it was the uncomfortableness of not knowing if we were able to use his material that I was focused on. But so there are pieces of his thing that I would want to pull out if let's say I were working in a group with Joanne and some other of my friends where we would just need to have this one or two pieces of that. And Stacy, thank you for bringing our attention to that. That was a really lovely point to make in a very Marley way. And when I said this is actually more Marley than I think it is, what I meant was we're thinking of publishing books, you know, a book or several books, but then the books are more are not as interesting as the thing online, the thing behind the book. And also some components of any of the matter in any of the books might be animated or automated or uh, whatever the right word is there, into something that could be really super useful. And, and it, it sort of collapses up into a couple pages or paragraphs in a book book thing, uh, but then it's more interesting in a, a different manifestation. And the more we can lather, rinse, repeat on that, the more useful and interesting whatever it is we're creating, I think, is. And that sounds like a great path. Other thoughts? Yeah, I think that intent and vision, uh, once that is defined, will impact the remainder of these not the, the remaining nine questions. And so far, we don't really have much of intent and vision on the table. Um, so we're talking more about infrastructure and process, but not intent and vision. So what are we? Where are we going with this? So a thing we could do rather than wait, and we may want to wait for Stuart to facilitate the whole process in a one 90 minute session of these calls, or we could dig right into intent and vision right now. We're recording these calls that would give us a big leg up on what we think we're doing. We could take some notes together 
and we could at least dig dig deep into that first uh, first topic, which I think is super important. And Klaus, I think you're totally right to to steer us back toward that. I I wonder if maybe I I almost hear Klaus's um, I I hear Klaus in a in a little bit different way, which is uh, okay, great. So now on yet another call, we've spent forty minutes on on infrastructure and process, and zero on content. I think, so maybe Klaus, I disagree a little bit. I think we have a pretty clear intent and vision. We've got it written down in a couple places. Uh, you know, we've decided at least to have a, what Jerry's written, I think, and maybe what I've written Tom um, and the, the outputs of this meeting, we have those on a few pages. Here's the intent of the project. Here's the vision. Here's especially a vision for a first book. And, and I think, I think we could take all of that and use that in that 90 minute session with Stuart, uh, you know, lift and shift. Here's the intent and vision of Marley and the intent and vision of the first book. I think we already have that. Would you I don't put think we the screen. What's that? Can you put this on the screen? Sure. Yeah. So, so a couple of things to what Pete just said. Um, first, I don't think everybody's aware of the pages you just described, Pete. So, so we haven't done a good job of sharing out and and talking through together what those things even are. So, so when Klaus is like, "Hey, what's the intent and vision?" and when Stuart is frustrated because we don't have an agreement to where we're going, I think that's evidence that we haven't really even shared those things out very well. But then, but then also uh, to take a different look on your different look of what I said originally, Pete. Um, I think that having the discussion about vision and intent is in fact where infrastructure and content begin to meet in a very nice and in a very elegant way that diving into the first step of Stuart's process is both infrastructure because hey look we're doing this process to get to an agreement but it, it it helps us consolidate and figure out what we mean by by this project at all which is like work we need to get busy on right now and would please Klaus and would please me and might please a couple other people on the call so I'm, I think it's a it's a very nice convergence point. Not a I don't think there's a dilemma there. I think that 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 we should like get busy, as they say. Dave, I noticed yeah, we got you to tears early on, so that was yeah. No, I'm having it's just another symptom of age, I'm afraid. Um, the uh, and I apologize for being you know like diving in from nowhere, right? So please. that is how we work, dude. <laughs> <laughs> apologies in advance for all the non sequiturs, and I miss what Stuart was saying and everything, but. I mean, I had two observations. One is, Klaus, I kind of agree with you on the, the vision and focus thing, but I do think there's two types of people in the world, and there's the people who, you know, dialogue is in and of itself kind of a good process, and there's other people that say dialogue, and like me, more like if you, if dialogue only serves a purpose, if you have a purpose kind of, and and I've run it, I've, I've kind of internalized this notion that there really are two types, and I'm in, I'm in the, I want the purpose side of it, but the other type exists, and, you know, I try to be patient with them. Um, but then the the other thing I just wanted to toss into this notion of the book, and and again, I don't know the backstory where you guys are on the book, but but the email on some of the OGM list, like with Klaus and Ken recently, had me thinking about the value of the different perspectives. I was thinking of, you know, what's that, um, there's that meme that goes around where you have the the nine, you know, from two different directions, and then like some people see it as a six, and some people see it as a nine, and they're both correct. And I was thinking that the email, that the point of what well, the problems, a lot of the issues we're dealing with depend on the perspective you, from which you see them. And if you could develop a tool that lets you play with perspective, that might be really useful. And so, you know, instead of a book, could we do a kaleidoscope or something that is a perspective choosing device or something like that? And one of the, to me, the, the outcome kind of things that I think is important is that we need to find overlapping perspectives or shared perspectives. And I was thinking, for example, we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be talking about, uh, oh, I was having an argument with a friend of mine who's like really big into climate change. And I'm saying climate change is the wrong focus. And he says, you know, look, if we had a tax on carbon, we could um, return that to people and would reduce poverty, right? It's like, okay, but that's then a different, now we've got a climate intervention that has a poverty outcome and that's the different perspective you know or or you know regenerative ag helps helps biodiversity kind of you know we do we want to be able to recreate the multiple perspectives so anyway i'm just wondering if this book project could be a multiple perspective creation device of some sort thanks dave 
Yeah, that's great, Dave. I hope I hope it I hope we'll do that. Um, I was going to um, uh, I was going to share screen and look at um, the documents that we've got. So um, in the wiki, which is also a website, uh, let me put this link in the chat. <clears throat> Um, uh, so we're kind of, we, we dance around a little bit, the, let me look at what this is called intent and vision. So we've got intent pretty well defined, I think, um, at least to get us enough off the ground and, and there's a bit of vision too. Um, I think we can kind of, um, between this and maybe cherry picking some of this. This has actually got a fair amount of vision stuff in it. Um, I think we should just like kind of grab this and and get doing, you know, kind of 80%. Um, this is what we're trying to do. I think we've got enough understanding to do that pretty well. Um, so then, um, then we've kind of got a, uh, um, uh, in, uh, I think where Jerry and I were, were thinking we could flesh out the, the remaining 20% or 30% of intent and vision of Marley, um, uh, we kind of identified that if we just wrote a book, um, so this is kind of a one level down intent uh, and, sorry, I have to keep going back to this, intent and vision. So, um, so this is a subproject of Marley. Um, our, our first subproject is the quick first book. Uh, and the intent and vision of this is to um, uh, have a, a book that addresses this. That, so the vision is to articulate this in book form. And we've got, you know, a fair amount of, you know, we've we've been accumulating this kind of. So you can, I maybe another thing, uh, you can see that. Uh, I don't know that it's super well uh, articulated here, but um, we're uh, part of the Marley. I I think um, the the I think the uh, vision and intent that we'll we'll come to agreement on is that. Marley isn't just creating a book, it's creating a bookshelf of books. And they're not really books, they're neo books or whatever you wanna call them. Um, and that there are things like a production process and, and a design Bible and documentation about how to do this. So Marley is, is, a, is a project to systematize the creation of additional books, like kind of like the quick first book is. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, I, I think, I, you know, it, we could, we could sit on that de definition, we could continue to blow out the definition of vision and intent, but we kind of 80, 20 did, and we've got the 80% done And we've got, not only do we have the, the Marley done, we've got the sub project, uh, quick first book done, uh, 80%. And, and we could just assign tasks, do writing, you know, um, figure out who, who's gonna figure out how to publish it and all that kind of stuff. We're kind of ready to go. For anybody who missed it, just in case uh, there was a photo of our namesake at the bottom of that page, Marley is uh, Stacy's recently deceased uh, pup. Um, but uh, let's go back to clarifying questions or Klaus, Klaus does that help you frame intent and vision or what's missing? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how actionable we want to make this. Now, so the, this is a very high level um, introduction and it's good, Peter, I like what you did here. Um, but where do we go with this? You know, the... the so so maybe, maybe I can interrupt and, and say, um, everything Pete just showed was not anything about agriculture or water or the substance of regenerative anything in the quick first book. <clears throat> that is its own project and organization that would probably need an agreement for what that book is. 
I'm just guessing here. So what what the agreement that Pete was kind of what the intent and vision that Pete was matching up with here was really about the whole Marley project, which is not substantive on any particular topic and could be a collection of books, as Pete just said, exactly as he just said. But the moment we we dip into, hey, here's the proposed outline for the quick first book, or here's an alternative outline, then we get into a very detailed specifics about what is the goal of that book. Um, and what is the vision of, of doing stuff with it? And I don't know if I'm being preemptive here and, and assuming that was part of what your, your question was, Klaus, or, or not. Yeah, so my impression was that we, we want to create um, the, the topics proposal, the Smiley project, a series of books. And then our first goal is to co-write a quick first book, right? And so my understanding is that's where we are. We want to co-write a quick first book. And that quick first book you know, is about food revolt, fix your land, eating within our bioregion. So that's where I'm at. I mean, that's where I was, right? Exactly. And I was trying to tell you why we didn't talk about any of that stuff so far. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I get this. But then you know, my question is, so what we are doing um, uh, now with Stuart is, is um, uh, um, are we are we talking about this big umbrella and and flesh that out further? Do we have enough information? Do we have enough thought, you know, uh, put into this, uh, or do we advance into a quick first book so we get our uh, uh, feet wet, so to speak? So we you know we we can practice on one project, and then we can add other projects to it and go through a similar process of finding. First of all, who are the right people to contribute? What are the subject matter experts we, we should be talking to? And so on and so on. So that, that's that's was sort of my thought process here. Anybody? So it's a prototype, right? I mean, look at it as a prototype. Yes. Which, which is a prototype? Look at which is a prototype. Doing the quick first book, right? Could be seen as a prototype project on how do you do things like this? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I I asked because I mean that's how I see it. And to be honest, I see two books. I see the food thing, but I also see the thing that Stuart just introduced as a book in itself, bringing like what Dave just talked about of uh, different perspectives. That's a book I want to write. I'm gonna I'm gonna start. You know, we talking about we. I'm already thinking about regardless of the Marley project, something I want to write for the Plex. And it all fits in. And go ahead, Jerry, jump in. Oh, that's fine. I'm waiting till you're done. So again, I came here to support the project and we decided we're going to work on this one book. So like, actually, that's why I asked Joanne to come because I happened to know she, well, I didn't know at the time she was interested in gardening, but I knew she was interested in editing and I knew there would be a place for her and so I, I and I like being with her. So I asked her to come for, you know, to help for whatever. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that's where the renegotiation comes in. Like as things are becoming clear and different ideas are sprouting, like we may need periods where we talk about what we're doing because while well, there may be one great vision the intents for each little project are going to be a little different. You know, Pete's intention is always going to have to do with infrastructure. Somebody else's intention, like my intention is always going to be centered around values or getting people to engage. That doesn't mean we won't do other things to help other people. But again, this is a space, I mean, yeah, I'll stop talking. <laughs> I, I wonder, I, I can imagine a couple things we can do for 35 minutes. One of them is um, one of them is going through Stuart's model, either for Marley or the quick first book. Um, another thing that we could do is uh, continue to work on on the quick first book, which I think would feel good. Um, do we have a I, so I guess I, I and I guess um, so a question I have for Stuart is 
and maybe for the, the whole team, my hypothesis is that Marley wants to be an organization and each book wants to be an organization. A lot of books will probably just copy paste the whole Marley agreement and, and kind of ratify it. They probably won't change it much. Some of them might change it a lot. Some of them might come in with something else uh, like Earth, Moon, Stars, uh, Space would be, you know, could be a Marley project, um, but it would have its own model. So I think there's, I, I think one agreement for Marley is going to constrict all the, the additional projects. So my guess is that they're, they're actually, each, each is an organization. Um, I, I don't think that, I'd, I'd like to hear Stuart's thoughts about that. And maybe we need to think about that as a team or something like that. I don't think we need to do that now. I don't think it's good to try to do Stuart's process without Stuart. So, um, so maybe we should work on the book. Um, I wanted to throw something else in from something you said, Stacey, in the middle of what you're what you just said, which was uh, from Stewart's contribution that he showed us at the start of this at the start of this call. Uh, several different thoughts. One is, well, gosh, he's that's actually an excerpt from a book he actually published years ago that is a finished book. I assume the publisher has rights to it, but don't know. And I, th that that raises a bunch of really interesting questions about just that book and, and its presence in the world. Um, the second thought is, I have a funny feeling that that Pete, in, in a parallel universe, is writing a book about the future of organizations and how people in distributed groups uh, share value and work together. And that some sense of a chapter on agreements that might reference the agreements in Stewart's book might be a, a component of a book that Pete would like to co-write with other people thinking about those issues. And so what? So I feel like we need a parking space, and I've forgotten the conversation we had, a sandbox, a, a shelf, a place to put contri contributed pieces, like Ken, Ken sent a couple of us uh, uh, basically two, three pages worth of, of group dynamics uh, illustrations that were interesting, but were not, not really even a chapter for a book yet. Um, we're, they're, they're basically uh, fodder for um, the seed of an idea. And if, if the seed then germinates and turns into something that smells like a book, then in Pete's book might be like, not about, hey, how to get to agreements. Pete's book might be about, this is the future of organizations, of distributed organizations. And here is a stake in the sand uh, about that. And it might be super interesting because it could be a, a, you know, a vast exploration of the future as opposed to a handbook for how to do agreements, right? Um, and uh, Pete, I'm making all of this up, but I'm, I, I know you well enough That's to know exactly that. exactly what I'm thinking. That's yeah. exactly what I'm thinking. But then the question is, in our process, and this is why the Marley process is sort of interesting this way, um, it's about how do we recruit people who have interest in these different kinds of books? How do those people break off and find an agreement? And I think by that, I mean the 10 steps of Stuart plus some Earth, Moon, Stars, uh, something like that, so that they can go off and decide, oh, our book is going to be mostly locked down intellectual property. We're going to find a traditional publisher. We're going to go make money from this book. It's not the way I'd like to work, but somebody in Marley might want to do something like that with an original idea they've got going now. I think our general spirit is to build things that are extremely shareable um, and extremely open. And then if somebody wants to buy the book as a souvenir, rock on, and those funds will come back in to cover our costs and maybe be distributed out among contributors, blah, blah, blah. But I but I think that um I think that that how we frame things like Stewart's 10 steps to agreement. Um, is a, an interesting Marley conversation so we understand how Marley functions. I'm and happy to shelve that for now because I'm not really that interested in doing that. Well, I think I think shelving the contribution is the right thing to do with it right now because we're trying to sort of go toward the quick first book um, and this is not a component of that. But I loved your enthusiasm about it earlier and I share it. And I'm trying to put words around what that means in terms of our longer term process. So for the Marley project, and the only reason I say I'm like, there are like, for me, there's two agreements we need. And we could talk about that at another time. We don't need to talk. And so that's why I'd rather not like, let's, let's work around classes, the book. <laughs> cool. So Pete, uh, sorry, before I switch topics and head back into doing a little bit of work with the 30 minutes we have left, 
Anybody else have thoughts, questions, reflections on where we are on this stuff? Oh, cool. And Baron Kaler changed author rights a lot way back when. They revolutionized the author contract. This is something April learned because BK is also her publisher. And they, um, they're they really good for authors. So that's, that's cool. Thanks for looking that up. Um, any other thoughts, reflections on this spot where we are? Okay. Um, there being none, then... Pete, how do we talk about the book without going into the intent and vision and agreement part of it? What's a what's a comfortable way that we could do 30 minutes of work on this together and make some progress? Um, the other thing that we'd want to talk about before we could really start working well is roles. Um, but I, th I think if we just start talking, um, maybe with the HackMD open, um, I... Let, let, I'll, I'll try to drive that. Sounds great. Um, um, Stacy, I, I wonder, uh, we, you kind of, um, you kind of accepted the role of project czar, uh, at least until we get Zar something Zarina. better. Zarina. Yeah. No. Uh, oh, oh, perfect. Awesome. This Wait, is, no, no, keep that on. It'll this mess my still, hair. I want to go out later. Uh, okay. This is still you, right, Stacy? For, for until we get the first book done, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, um, I think uh, we we could talk about the title and how we think about titles. Um, uh, I think we've currently it's Food Revolt, and we decided that was kind of a holding, at least a holding name for now, and then we can re rename it more later. We could talk about names. Uh, we could talk about um, this uh, outline uh, and this outline, and see if they're how close they are. Or how far away they are. Bye, Jesse. <laughs> um, we could talk about who might who might write um, and who might help write. Uh, we could dive into a, a deeper thing like what's a bioregion. Uh, uh, and I, I was interested two calls ago in the bioregion question about how it becomes the framework for a book and all that. I'd love to have that conversation. Yeah, I was just uh, coming back from a conference on uh, rewilding Oregon. You know, it was a retreat uh, out in the woods and that uh, was hosted by a group of NGOs, um, uh, wildlife society I mean, groups and fo groups focused on, on public lands you know, and land management and so on. Um, and, and the overarching topic really in in terms of bioregion is an understanding of soil um, and i've i've noticed how people really respond in a very emotional uh, way once they realize that soil is really a living entity so in our western culture you know we've, we have lost the understanding i mean i've never really thought of uh, of soil as a living thing um my own son um, I showed I, I showed him one of my PowerPoints, and there's a slide where there is a spoon of soil, and it says that this spoon of healthy soil contains more microbes than there are people living on this planet. You know, and it really it really hit him, you know, how how amazing that is. And so it it really starts with I think, and as from an introductory perspective, it really has to start with our soil is completely alive and over 4 billion years of evolution um the the soil and, and the microbes and the, the life inside the soil has specialized to the bioregion within which it lives because it all depends on the type of soil that it's dealing with it depends on access to water it depends on its climate yeah so so the the living conditions define how soil has adapted itself. 
to that. And then out of that soil, of course, come plants which feed animals and within the soil, uh, the microbial life spawns higher forms of life, you know, insects, worms, which then in turn feed birds and mammals and so on. So it's this, this understand this, this emotional connection to soil uh, as a starting point. And then, then an explanation of how soil, how this life has adapted itself to local conditions. And, and, and how, what can be grown here and what can be uh, consumed in a way from a very indigenous thinking perspective has to be aligned with the capacity of this local bioregion here uh, to produce sustainably you know, specific types of, of foods that, that nourish us. You know? um, so, so I think that's, that's sort of where bioregion has to, the understanding of bioregion has to sort of initiate, you know. And I, I love the framing as bioregion because I think it's a good representation of kind of the, like, I don't know, this next era issue, right? It's, it's, it, it's, it's the thing that doesn't have a governance structure around it. It's the thing that requires large scale collaboration. It requires negotiation, things like that. Um, sorry, Jerry, Mike. Uh, don't be sorry at all. I was just raising my hand to go in when you're done. Okay. Well, and and, and so and it's out to me, it's a it's a pretty fun example of why I want different perspectives because so Klaus just enunciated kind of a soil perspective, but if I don't yet care about soil, but I do care about jobs, I want the job entry to the bio bio region discussion, or I care about pretty rivers. You know, I want the pretty river entry to the bio region. You know. And so I feel like if we could have these uh, somehow lenses that then lead you into the next lens, right? That's the, the translation connection part because the bioregion regeneration answer, I think, is going to be multiple reinforcing perspectives, right? Um, successfully engaging collaboratively, right? So it'll be the soil people and the mining people somehow coming to terms, right? Or or whatever it is, the soil people and the tourism people coming to terms, right? And so, you know, how do we, can we can we create a, a device that allows us to, you know, enable that kind of convergence? Um, I, I have a quick story. I, I apologize, John, maybe I can tell it real quick. Um, Dave, the, the mining, you know, soil health thing reminds me of a story in Australia. Um, the, there's a, there's a, um, mining magnet who's, you know, kind of strip mined a lot of, a lot of Australia. And as he's gotten older, he's, um, he's got religion kind of, and, uh, he spends a lot of his money now, um, working on, uh, uh, the oceans and kelp and things like that and using kelp to regenerate soil and stuff. So he's kind of trying to balance, uh, back his, his life in, in one person, um, with billions of dollars and you know thousands of people, but um, it, it reminded me of that. That's Sorry. great. I kind of took it because of a, a old Regenesis. Regenesis has a case study about I can't remember what city it is in Mexico that they're trying to do a, a redesign of you know a regenerative design of this area, and it's a it's like a oil uh, production facility, you know. And and basically re, the Regenesis point was: look, you may not like this oil production facility, but it's the heart of your economy. So you have to somehow grapple with it, you know, and then they're able to figure out ways that the oil company and the, you know, the and people want nitro preservation can work together, right? So that, you know, it, it's it's like we we do need mining probably for some period of time, right? So this guy may have done it poorly, but it's not going to stop even if it's done well, right? I mean, yeah, you know, the bioregion is probably going to have mining in it. Um, Joanne, do you mind if I go quickly? I, I didn't use my Zoom hand, but um, so. Bioregions are, are likely a thing that some people have not heard of at all, and we could just explain them. And that feels to me a little bit like a science text. And I'm, I'm, I'm proposing here several different texts, and I want to know which one you're interested in writing. And to me, a descriptive text about what how bioregions work and why they're kind of cool and so forth is interesting, but not gripping. I, I'm not like, wow, that's awesome. Uh, a text that says, hey, bioregions are the next governance model for the world is a different thesis and is gripping to me. 
And John Wesley Powell, basically uh, the guy who just sort of floated down the Colorado River with one uh, with one arm because he'd lost one in the Civil War, tied to a chair on the deck of some rowboats. Um, he submitted to Congress a plan to take everything west of the Mississippi and map, map the new states out according to their watersheds, not bioregions, but watersheds, which I find a really, really interesting notion. Of course, that's the era of slave states or free soil states. So we were busy dividing up states so they would get votes in, in Congress and all that kind of crap. And we're sort of still sitting with that. And if greater Idaho secedes, we'll see some changes on that. But anyway, the idea of bioregions as a new governance model and maybe also as a pro proposition that we should we should create a virtual bioregional governance system ourselves and screw how states are organized and just go do that and create an alternate form of government, which is not at all what you've been saying, Klaus. I'm just saying that's a really interesting book that requires all this cool information about what bioregions are and why they're important. And now I would be like, oh, now I need to understand more fundamentally how bioregions operate and what, how they're different, et cetera, et cetera. A different book would be one that says, hey, the food system is screwed. Big Ag has a screwed. All the middlemen have a screwed. A lever to pry the food system away from them would be to think about food in a bioregional way. <clears throat> and I don't know enough to say what would be in that book, but that book would have to explain bioregions and why they're cool also, <clears throat> but it wouldn't stop there. And the thesis of that book would be like, hey, we're taking back our food system. And this might be Food Revolt, which is a title I like, but this would be a food revolt against Big Ag. And maybe you don't explicitly go against Big Ag because you don't want to do a negative thing. How do you tune that? How you frame that is a whole different question. But I'd be very excited to contribute to that book as well. Um, so I'm trying to say, what, even though we're trying to do a quick first book, and I know it's only going to be a couple chapters and, and we're not going to go that far with it, it would be cool if, or maybe this is the second, maybe the quick first book is a descriptive book about bioregions. The second book takes that and wraps it into two different theses or three that are all about food and, 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 and agriculture and all that. And that's where the things I'm putting on the table show up. I don't know that I may be overcomplicating things because that's how I that's how I operate uh, all too often. Um, but I hope I, I hope it's making sense that what I'm saying about um, there's lots of things we can say that make the argument about bioregions much more richly than, hey, bioregions are important. And Klaus, did that make sense what I just said? Yeah, you know, I just posted uh, an article here, bioregions, you know, what is your bioregion? And that I think speaks very much to what you were just saying. Um, cool, I, I, that's still very descriptive. It still looks very sciencey. It doesn't have a thesis, what you just said. What do I mean to, to how to how to frame it and how to word it? You know, but just yeah. to have an agreement on the topic itself, right? So this is uh, this is the frame. I mean, this is a bioregion. Germany is a bioregion, but then it breaks down within smaller subsets of bioregions because Bavaria and and North 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 Rhine and Westphalen has different uh, cultures again, right? So so here. We have a lot of bioregions in the U.S., but they have been overpowered, you know, by a centralized food system that negates the uniqueness of Oregon versus New York, you know, or Florida. And so, just to make the, and this can be a wonderful textual uh, storyline, right? How how the amazing bioregions that we have within the United States and how unique they are in in uh, their flora and fauna, and uh, and how we should cherish what, what we have and promote it. No? So yeah, we can absolutely do this. And in this context, you know, food is a subset. You know, it, it doesn't have to be the story itself. It's part of the story because why would we you know, overpower this nature with GMO crops you know, that require heavy doses of chemicals that kill you know, our local ecosystem? That sort of line of thinking. Thank you, thank you. Um, Joanne and Pete. Um, so, oh, am I muted? Oh, no, I'm not. Nope, um, so fine. I am one of those people, few people probably, who gets excited at the talk of soil. I can watch um, and read stuff about soil all the time because I garden, I see the difference between like healthy soil and not. And um, I just want to say that I was excited about what David said. Um, I know from knocking on doors for political stuff, you can't just say, hey, this is important. It should be important to you. You have to go up to someone and say, what's important to you? What issues concern you? Same thing with soil. 
people who know soil and know how important soil is, not everyone's going to be excited about soil. And what David said was perfect. You've got to find something to, people might not care about soil, but they'll care about other stuff connected to soil, that soil. Um, and, and so he did it, perfect, and I totally agree with that. And I think um, that's really important because we want to get as many people as possible. It's such an important issue. If we could hit as many people as possible to realize this, and it might not be through soil, it might not, they might not even realize that soil is what we're talking about, but find something that could um, make people want to create better um, soil. But what Klaus said, Klaus just to hit something I was gonna say, if you can't talk about soil without talking about the GMO, the GMO crops that need infinite Roundup and other herbicides and pesticides. I mean, I remember the first time I saw on a documentary, the a farmer picking up a soil, and I don't, it was dirt, it wasn't soil, soil. Um, if you use these chemicals over and over again, you have to start buying, and they're pretty expensive things to um, make enrich your soil because you're basically killing off all these. When, when Klaus said that you know one handful of dirt carries more um, organisms in it than all the population in the world, that's if the soil is organic or if it hasn't had year after year after year of these chemicals going in there. And I think you have to. I'd like to include something about the fact that soil is wonderful, soil is great, but we're destroying soil and there's soil, there's dirt out there that should be soil. And when Jerry mentioned big, big agriculture, um, we, there's two things, you, you could try to get rid of big agriculture or you could try to influence big agriculture, like peer pressure to get big agriculture to change their ways. And um, I don't know, which is like, I mean, it would be nice of things that we might not be able to ever get rid of big ag, big ag, but maybe if we could get them to see that uh, either their um, uh, stockholders or somebody cares if they change their ways, that might be something. So I'm done. Thank you. You're muted, Pete. <laughs> Rookie. This first Zoom. <laughs> Joanne is about 10 feet that way from me. So <clears throat> um, I muted while she was talking. Um, uh, we're getting close to time. Um, so I think maybe we should switch to next steps a little bit. Um, uh, so we're, we've talked about um, doing a 90 minute session with Stuart to write the agreements for Marley. Um, uh, uh, QFB needs probably a set of agreements too, maybe. Um, uh, maybe we can just kind of copy and paste the Marley ones and, and tweak them a little bit. Um, and then the quick first book needs to get written. So we need to kind of take some of this discussion and uh, continue to um, continue to use the one or the other or both of these outlines um, and the draft summary to write the book. So I wonder, I've got a question for the group. Um, do we want to spend, uh, maybe allocate is a better way to say it. Do we want to allocate uh, these meetings for book writing? Uh, do we want to have that in a separate meeting? Uh, is that all of us? Is it uh, a subset of us? I have a feeling until we get down to the nitty gritty of what's in each chapter and who wants to pick up this piece and go write it and all that, which we're not standing right in front of, we probably want to go march forward as a group so we learn as much as we can about the process. And when we get to that spot, then whoever is really interested in writing Food Revolt goes and creates separate meetings and 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 does that. But let's 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 I, get to that point together. I yeah, I, uh, I like that idea, and I worry about um, uh, I worry about being a committee working on a project. Um, I think two, maybe three people working together could merge the outlines that we've got, identify, you know, kind of the overarching narrative so the thing makes sense and yada, yada. I, I worry that doing that in plenary is going to be kind of overweight. 
which you know maybe I, I, I do like the idea that you know um, we should keep the, the team together and learn learn to, together. But at some point, we have to get into work mode where it's literally you know writing uh, writing stuff or editing stuff out of chat GPT and agreeing about the outline and things like that that is going to be slower with six people than two. And that's the point at which I would say that it should be the two or three that want to be doing it. Uh, and distinguishing when we're at, when we fit that spot is important. So, um, Joanne and Stacy. Yeah, I just want to say, I thought someone had said or Stuart had said that what Stuart's thing could in itself be a, a book. And I'm wondering if you're going to do that before actually writing the first book and Stuart's book be the first book, because as you're doing it, you kind of could, it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be like a big, you know, 300 page book, like, like while Klaus's or the food thing could be the first book, this is like a pre-book or something like that. Like a, cause it seems to me if you're putting all that work, wouldn't that make a great book? I don't know. Stuart, Stuart has that book already. The, um, the, the one he actually published or the one he wanted to do that the publisher said no, Let's publish another book. I thought he said he had the book and they didn't want that one, so he wrote another one. Which he wrote. Yeah. So there wouldn't this be like the ideas he had isn't um, a little bit different? Uh so probably what we want to do is spend 90 minutes with uh Stuart and get Marley agreements yeah. set up and then get to work on okay. on the bioregional food book. Even so, though it would it would be because that's a, it seems like that's kind of within our grasp. It's, you know. Yeah, okay. And it's something that we have to do together rather than having Stuart be way far ahead of us on his homework. Okay. So this is how I feel, which sort of combines a few different opinions. David mentioned the place where, think, where people from different viewpoints converge. And so I always come here with that hope that this is where people and those conversations come together. So to that point, I'm going to put in. So this is my friend Hillary's project, and I had been speaking to her and Klaus. I wanted to introduce her to you because I was talking to her about a different project that I'm really excited about. And we want all of a sudden I find out that in her working life, she works in, re in regenerative agriculture. And it just connected everything to me because I wanted, again, I had told Pete and Jerry that I had this like other thing that I wasn't gonna put any kinks in this thing, but I was still working on, which had to do with women's voices. I shared some of it with Joanne. But anyway, I recommend you all look at that project because you'll see this grander vision and it has this very Disney kind of feel to it, which whenever I see Disney, I think of Jerry and Klaus and myself, because Disney has really influenced me, but that's another story. The point I'm, where, what, where I'm trying to get to is, I probably won't attend a 90 minute steward presentation on making agreements. I'll show up maybe for the end and make any agreements for me. I don't really know that it's necessary for the Marley Project at this point, parts of it are and how I would find it useful. If there was a call where people were showing up and we were actually talking about what is my personal intent? What is your personal intent? What are you personally willing to do? What are you personally, you know, if those kinds of things were coming out because as much as Stuart said, yeah, I'm totally willing, I, I'm like the native way. There are other people that I know by watching them, they don't feel that way and that's fine but I'm interested in getting those conversations out. But because I know Klaus, I know Hillary, I know Joanne, if I'm working in a group with them and they're putting together a first book, those issues are not coming up. So there's no reason that I have to work on a set of agreements to work on this sample book. And- You can, you can actually just, it's still worth that whole agreement framework any at any point you can say we just agree to trust each other next thing but respectfully mm -hmm. i don't want to and and i mean i, I mean, i'm well, saying it blood I, like that but wait something listen, that... listen listen but just let me finish 
I'm not holding you back from it. Like I said, I probably won't show up. I'll come in at the end and whatever you've got decided, I'll be like, oh yeah, that's fine. So it's not like I'm saying, no, you guys can't do that. I'm not doing that at all. I'm just saying, I'll step out while you're doing that and I'll do something that's more pleasing to me because it's actually more pleasing to me to not do that because I'm coming from a place more of, I know if I put the right people together, those things are done. We can still verbalize it. We could still, like, like I have an agreement. Uh, I have an agreement that I value, um, I value community engagement over production, knowing that something is being produced that isn't being seen. That's my, that's a personal value I have. Somebody may agree, somebody may not. It's good to know that upfront because that's gonna shape how you go ahead and what the tasks are. And, and you can decide if you want to push, you know, say, well, you know what, I'm working with this group, so I'm gonna push that aside. I'm gonna do it their way, which is what I'm doing. I'm gonna do it your way, but I just might step out of the room. The, the process of coming to an agreement isn't to write an agreement and have it look all legal and stuff like that. The process of creating the agreement output is actually, I think, just what you said, a bunch of people talking about individually what's important to them, their intent, their envision, and how that matches with everybody else. So I think if you step out of the room for the agreement part and then come in at the end and say, oh yeah, whatever you guys said, you've missed the, the part that you both like and that's important to you. So, so the reason if, for that if is, Stuart is, you know, if we're drafting a legal legal document, I, I agree. I, you know, why would we do that? If we're talking about, well, I thought, you know, the, the vision that I had for Marley was, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then everybody stitches that together or somebody says, well, okay, I'll see you all later. This is not the, the thing I signed up for. That's the agreement process. And the agreement is the exhaust of that the process of working it out together as a group, talking about what's important to each of us, that's the, that's the meat of it, that's the juice, that's the- And in the my work. experience, maybe because we don't usually start with questions, I don't really hear that we get to talk about that. It, 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 for me, and this is mostly in male environments, a premise is usually thrown on the table and then we get to like work around it. It's in, yeah, so the, that's, if there's a premise that, that you have to agree with to be in the room, then we've, we've messed up. The, the agreement process is broken. And you should, just, you, know, you, you should just say, hey, guys, I don't agree with this, or I don't agree with part of this. Or, and we can either talk about it, or kind of what you said already, you can just log out you know, and say, OK, I guess I'm not part of this. Um, I'm voting with my feet. I'm leaving. The, if, if we don't do an agreement where we actually talk about what's important to each of us, we've messed up the agreement process. I agree. And like, we've just been doing a little bit of that right now. And this is the way I like to do it. Um, anyway, so I, I, all I want to say is I put the video in. I really would like you to see it because I was going to invite her to a call anyway to introduce her. If we're going to, because I thought we were going to just focus on the book. So I thought, you know, and that's why having Joanne there and having Hillary there, I thought just having a conversation might spark some new ideas. And then maybe people would want to come to add to that book. And at the same time, we've also had another conversation, which is the agreements, the values, the we, the kaleidoscope. And some of those people might be interested in writing that. And the conversation, you know, can split off and come back together and the relationships are building between the different groups of people that go in and out of, you know, that are interested in different things. And, you know, anyway. kind of the way I think about it, if, if a group of people want to, if you, Stacy, if you want to skip the agreement process, I think that's fine and say, let's do a book. Um, you don't need to have the agreement written down. You don't have to go through all the discussion of everything. Kind of what Stuart is saying is you, you know, you pay up, you pay me now or pay me later. What happens if somebody disagrees or what happens if somebody's feelings get hurt or whatever, but that's fine. Right. If you, if, 
if there's a group of people who say, you know, we could be a lot more effective instead of spending this 90 minutes writing, you know, talking about agreement stuff, let's just write the book. They should do that. They should so just question, do it. So, no, so, so maybe question. the thing to do with Marley, yeah. maybe the thing to do is to say, someday we'll get all this written down. Let's just get the freaking book written. Let's just do it. That would be a fine and wonderful way to proceed. So when I wrote down the next steps, you know, write the agreement with Stuart, write the Marley agreement, or sorry, write the QFB agreement. I, I put in front of that in no particular order. If we're writing the book and we don't need to do the Stuart agreement process to do that, more power to us. Let's get the book done. I, I think that's wonderful. I have one other option to throw in to, you know, to be one of those three, to be one of three choices. Um, what about inviting people, like I would be inviting my friend, inviting people to this call around this bioregion book to come and have a conversation, a discussion, just about the book, about sharing their thoughts and get, and getting to meet people. Like if you know a person that is working in this area that has the personality that would fit that, you know, just using your judgment, a friend of yours that you actually like working with, that you would love to be working with something on, and that's something that you click on, invite them and let, let's work together next week on that call. That would be my, that would be my suggestion to work on the book, but invite somebody in to talk about the subject matter, because so, that's the word, or so, maybe even divide the call. Well, so to my understanding, you're project lead right now. Um, I think what you should do is say, here's what we're going to do next call. Well, my, my leadership style is to throw it out and get a feel for what you guys want to do, because I'm interested in community engagement. So I need to know what we, would, I know how we, you feel. I know you. I know how you feel. How do I feel? <laughs> What, what would what do you think I want to do? I don't want to. I don't want to have to state it. I really don't know. What the thing David that I want to do most I is to know write what would the make David book. come back. Okay. No, I what I want to do. Is if I may just, uh, because I think we're really and we're out of time. If I put my imagineering hat on yes. for a while, since I spent ten years with Disney doing stuff like this, you know, every single project starts with the blue sky uh, imagination part, right? So, so you have a blue sky vision, creative uh, idea that uh, of something that you want to do. So, you, so you you flesh that out as much as you can. Then that goes into a feasibility and reality check. Now, with Disney, it also goes into a financial feasibility part. We don't have to worry about this, but it goes into how do you do this? What are the technical uh, uh, frame that we need to do this with, right? And then you spin it out further. Well. We are sort of on step two, right? But we haven't done step one, which is what is this creative concept that we're discussing here? So my, idea, my, my expectation today was we talk about intent and vision because that drives the whole project. You know, once we have a definition of, you know, are we talking about bioregions in what context and how do we frame this, right? And so once we have that fleshed out, then you know, the roles and promises and so on will fall into place after this. Yeah? So it's, it's, but always, always creative intention dominates, right? That's the only thing we really have. And then we have to figure out how to make it work from a technical perspective. Yeah? Um, I agree with what you just said, Klaus. And I think that the unexpected thing that's stepped in between is that we were talking about an agreement for the Marley project, which doesn't go into... The discussion you would like to have which is the agreement for the quick first book project if that makes sense so there's two different levels and the marley project conversation which we don't need to have next week or the week right after in order to get working on writing the book uh, but but is really about the vision for marley as a whole now we could skip that and do intent and vision for quick first book as a call next week I'm just offering this up as a possibility for what we do, that, that that's a focus of our conversation next week, which I think serves multiple goals. One of them being it gets some progress on the book and gets us to agree on what the what the skin and bones of the or the skeleton rather of the of the book is. And then B, it does some work on the agreement at some level. Um, I'd be happy doing that. 
That sounds good. Sounds good to me. Stacey, you're good with that? Yeah, it works because, yeah, I agree. It'll, it might do two things at once. It does a little bit of both. I like that. Joanne, you uh, have maybe the last word. Actually, you and Ben. Um, I just have a quick question. So are you saying that there's going to be an intent and vision for the Marley project and then each book in itself will have an intent and vision? I kind of think they have to. Okay. Okay. Uh, that seems to be the way this is that, that, that this is playing out that 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 because everything is an organization and everything is a project or some hybrid thereof um that marley is a project which is sort of like a pub modern publishing house where it's more than publishing okay good so what the hell do we mean by that okay. then each of the each of the projects that, that, right. that float in into marley and decide that this is a really nice host this is a hospitable harbor and shipyard for our project um, they have to figure out, okay, so what is the intention and vision for this particular book? And you think we could go ahead with the first book before getting the whole Marley project intent and vision done? Okay. I think so. I think I think we sit down and start like diving into uh, intent and vision for the book, for the quick first okay. book. That will do some backfill work for us because we'll start to understand okay. what we mean by the project, but which we can go back to. But it'll also make us feel happy that we're making project on the book. Okay, thanks. Is, is everybody uh, on board more or less with uh, how that works? Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Pete, you're muted. Thanks. Key mistake. Um, uh, so we'll discuss and hopefully agree on intent and vision for QFB. Sounds great. Uh, the whole call? Half the call? I have no idea how long it'll take us. I would dearly love to get some actual work done. But to me, that's actual work. Um, but uh, Klaus, somehow I'm not hearing you. Yeah, Pete, that is an okay. astonishing comment. I want to get some actual work done. Because to me, the actual work is the, is the creative intent, is the creative component of this book. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's if we have this down, everything else will fall into place. It may not be okay. as perfect as so, we want it to be. Um, you know? Uh, so we'll probably do check in for five minutes or something like that. And I think we'll have afterthoughts from this conversation that we want we'll want to sort of feed back in. That sounds great. Uh, and and if we get the intent and vision agreed to, then a book group can go figure out when they want to meet separately and start dividing and conquering on what that might look like. Um, Well, Pete's thinking there. I just want I I kind of trashed Pete's document a little bit farther down, but trying to I was trying to enunciate elucidate to myself what the lenses kind of thing would be. And one of the things that came out of the lenses I felt like is a nice re, uh, there's a recursiveness to it that somehow like the lenses lead to each other somehow, and there's so there must be some notion of a of a hook back to another part, kind of. I mean, we're just doing hyperlinks here, really, but. But but logically within a bioregion, all that's the issue is that all the different pieces relate to each other, you know. And so I'm thinking about my business, but my business is related to the water supply and is related to the schools and is related to the agriculture, you know. So can we have a book that has that kind of, you know, my perspective connection to all the other perspectives kind of approach? It's really cool, Dave. Good. Sure, we can have chapters, right? Yeah. Yeah. And somehow the chapters like, you know, it's like, yes, soil is important, but then somehow the business chapter has to say, and we need soil, you know, so that I don't know. Cool. So it feels like we have a, a mission and a project and Pete, you'll, if you'll push that uh, to the, the OGM wiki, uh, that'd be great. Both, both pages. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Sounds awesome. Thank you. Good work, Saul. Thank Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. You guys are fun. <laughs> Bye.